center ourselves, and let's worship. Please stand and join me for the call to worship. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Hear me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, for I put my trust in you. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call on you. Please join me in the opening prayer. Redeeming Sustainer, Visit your people and pour out your strength and courage upon us, that we may hurry to make you welcome, not only in our concern for others, but by serving them generously and faithfully in your name. Amen. Please stay standing for the opening hymn. Our opening hymn. Oh, wow. Our opening hymn is... It's holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Uh, so as we sing this, let's just give praise to the most high, self-existent creator, uh, who alone has no beginning and no end. Uh, so he's our creator, and we owe our existence to him. So here's holy, holy, holy.
buddy. Why so glum, my chum? Well, it's just since my little brother was born, I've been kind of sad. How come? I mean, I would think you'd be excited to have a baby brother. I mean, you have someone to play with, someone to tell your secrets to, and someone to blame so that you don't get in trouble. Yeah, those things are great. But even though I have a new little brother, I feel very lonely. Oh, how come? Well, my little brother's kind of demanding. He always needs to be fed, burned, have diapers changed. My parents spend all their time fussing over the baby. No one's paying attention to me. Well, that's got to be rough. And on top of that, when people come over the house, they always want to see the baby. No one's interested in me anymore. Well, I don't mean to argue with you, but there is someone who is very interested in you. And what you are going through is very similar to what the characters in our Bible reading went through. Go on, I'm listening. In our story about Hagar and Ishmael, Ishmael experienced exactly what you are experiencing. He was the older brother who not only got ignored when his younger brother was born, but Ishmael and his mom were actually kicked out of the house because Abraham and Sarah loved Isaac more. But God was there to take care of them because God cares about those who are rejected and cast aside. So even though you might feel ignored by your family and neighbors, God sees you and loves you and is always there. Wow! Thanks for sharing all that. It does make me feel better knowing God always sees me and loves me. whom she had borne to, to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Be not displeased, because the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac shall your <coughs> offspring be named. And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman, also because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave, gave it to Hagar putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered to the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him, a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. And she said, let me not look at the death of the child but as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up, lift up the boy, and hold him fast with your hand. For I will make him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him 
from the land of Egypt. And God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and be <clears throat> from the land of Egypt. <laughs> okay, and the anthem. So we're so blessed again to have Leslie uh, singing with us. Leslie Ann Hernandez uh, singing. He knows my name. So yeah, God is omniscient and uh, and He knows all and He sees all. So He knows you know what's on our heart and we can cast all our burdens upon Him because He He told us that you know uh, uh, His yoke is easy and and His uh, burden is light. Our burden is light. <laughs> so here's uh, He knows my name. <laughs> Thank you. for being here. Uh, thank you for all those uh, participating in our worship service, uh, for Jack, uh, for being my wingman, for Pam and Pam and Rick and Kevin and Leslie. It's always a pleasure having you here. And, and Jeff in the back, um, whose job it is to go unnoticed. Uh, I've been back there plenty and a sound man does his job well if no one knows he's there. So, um, and I uh, have uh, family down from the, the Bay Area visiting, which it's, it's good to see them as well. And, and was talking last night uh, as they're kind of you know, talking about the, the service this morning. And, and I was recalling uh, many times that uh, Dan Overton uh, was here uh, filling in as a, a guest preacher. And I, I remember it kind of a recurring thing that he'd say, you know, I had this message all prepared. And then at four in the morning, you know, God woke me up and said, no, you're going to do this message instead. <laughs> And uh, I, I'm trying to work out this little arrangement with God where, you know, if, if I do my work and get everything done, that, you know, he won't make any changes after about 1030 at night. Um, but uh, I, I was up at 330, but that's because the dog had to go out and go potty and not uh, anything else. So um, let's, let's dive into uh, our, our message here about the God who sees. How many of you uh, remember the old 90s film, The, the Truman Show? few of you. Uh, in it, uh, Jim Carrey plays just this average Joe, who is unknowingly the, the subject of a reality show. Uh, as an infant, uh, he was adopted by a TV production company and grew up on this giant set of The Truman Show, uh, which was named after him. Everyone else on the show, from his parents, his schoolmates, even his wife, 
and his co-workers were all actors, um, playing these parts as World Watch, the 24 hours a day, a broadcast of the life of Truman, who didn't know that he was on the show. Uh, and the plot of the film is where Truman basically learns and, and begins to understand that you know, life isn't what it seems, and that basically his entire life is, is sort of a, a lie. Um, kind of a you know, really interesting uh, concept and idea. And there's one scene in particular that uh, I think is kind of interesting. Um, Truman is on his way to work, and he suspects that things really aren't as they appear to be. Um, before he arrives at, at the office, there's a shot of all the, the cast members of all the extras, just all the people of this town in their you know, starting positions. Uh, people who are about to get out of their cars or buying a cup of coffee at the curb, curbside coffee cart um, or at their desks in the office building. And they're all waiting for Truman to arrive and for the cameras to start rolling and for their scene to begin. And as soon as Truman arrives, all these actors kind of unfreeze and, and uh, jump into to action as if uh, you know, right on time, right on cue. And I remember uh, after that movie came out, there's kind of this unspoken fear that I think a lot of people had of, what if my life is just a lie and I'm a character on my own version of the, the Truman Show? What if all these people are just in on some big joke or something? And while that is likely not true, um, I think that <laughs> deep down, uh, we do all feel like stars of our own reality shows. Sure, we have our ensemble cast of our friends and family, uh, but everyone else is just the extras. Uh, all those people at the grocery stores or creating traffic on the freeway, or even our co-workers and acquaintances, are simply background players uh, in our stories. But how often do we think of them as the stars of their own shows? How often do we think about their hopes and dreams, or the fact that they just you know, simply cut their toenails just like we do? So our scripture reading is about one of these extras uh, in the biblical narrative, Hagar, uh, the Egyptian slave of Sarah, concubine of Abraham, and mother of Ishmael. Today we'll look at her story in Genesis 21 and consider how God views those who have been marginalized or discarded, the extras in our world, and then how we as God's people ought to view those who are marginalized and discarded. Before we dive into the story, let's consider some of the context and background. Um, if you remember, uh, this is going back several chapters and, and quite a few years in uh, the Genesis account. But uh, Abraham, or God calls Abraham away from his hometown and promises to make him the father of a great nation and gives him a promised land for his descendants. Um, Abraham obeys and travels to this promised land, but there's one minor hiccup in the whole father of a great nation thing, and that is the fact that Sarah, uh, his wife, is unable to conceive and bear a child. Several chapters later, uh, and several years later, uh, Sarah comes up with a, a workaround. She gives Abraham, her maidservant, uh, Hagar, uh, to bear uh, Abraham the, the child of promise. And not long after that, Hagar does become pregnant and has a son named Ishmael. Uh, and even though uh, Hagar does provide a son for Abraham, and even though this whole plan was uh, Sarah's idea, Sarah grows to despise Hagar. Some commentators say that perhaps Abraham had grown quite fond of Hagar and her son, favoring them over his wife, Sarah. Sarah treats uh, Hagar very badly to the point where Hagar just can't take it anymore and runs away. Uh, out in the wilderness and seemingly on the verge of death, Hagar encounters God, who tells her to go back to Abraham and Sarah. God assures Hagar that God has her back. God will take care of her and Ishmael, but because of the parallels between this story and the, the one we're looking at uh, today, there's actually two accounts where she runs away and encounters God, uh, this first one and then the, the one we're looking at today. I'm going to stop there and, and move into our present story. So our story from uh, Genesis 21, which uh, Pam read for us, to, to sum up again. So we have Isaac, who's the real child of promise, the, the one who God said, you know, this is the one through whom uh, the, the, the promise would be, uh, has been weaned, and Abraham uh, decides to celebrate with a great feast. And you know, I imagine that uh, with a high infant mortality rate, uh, in the ancient world, a child reaching this milestone is probably something we're celebrating. Presumably during the feast, the older brother or half-brother Ishmael is playing with Isaac, and this greatly bothers Sarah. What's the big deal? You know, why would Sarah get upset? It's just two brothers playing together. 
Um, and some of the, the scholars and, and commentators I read said that, you know, that they have a variety of opinions. And some think it's that it wasn't just playful, but maybe actually harmful. And you know, that he was perhaps throwing rocks at him or something like that. Um, and some even make a connection back to the play between Cain and Abel that led to Abel's death. And that perhaps Ishmael was you know, throwing stones at Isaac or doing something more harmful than just simply playful. And others point to Sarah's possible jealousy towards uh, Hagar and Ishmael uh, and speculate that after the birth of Ishmael, uh, Abraham favored Ishmael and his mother over Sarah. But whatever the reason, uh, Sarah's had enough and wants Hagar and Ishmael gone. Sorry, the throat's rather dry this morning. So Abraham's not happy about any of this, and, but God speaks to him to calm his distress and anxiety. And, and God says, essentially, do what your wife says. I'll take care of Ishmael and extend to him the promise uh, to make your offspring into a great nation. Which I think brings up a, a couple uh, important lessons. First, guys, listen to your wives. Uh, three of the most... Thank you. Uh, three of the most important words for us husbands to learn, uh, to quote the Princess Bride, are simply, as you wish. And second, uh, God is bound to keep God's promises, even when we try really hard to mess things up. God promised Abraham a son through which God would make uh, a great nation of chosen people. Abraham took matters into his own hands, but instead of punishing Abraham or Ishmael, God makes room in God's promises for this other son. God reminds Abraham of that promise, even though Sarah wants his son Ishmael to be banished. Because God's faithfulness is not based on us, it's not contingent on our actions or obedience. As Paul writes to Timothy, uh, when we are faithless, God is faithful because God cannot deny God's self. So the next morning, after uh, Sarah demands that they be expelled, Abraham gives Hagar and Ishmael some bread and water and sends them out into the wilderness. And unless they're taken in by the generosity of others, this is unfortunately likely a death sentence for them. A single mother and a young boy don't stand much of a chance uh, in the ancient world. And we're told that when the water and bread run out, which we don't really know how much they were given or how they rationed it, so it could be anywhere from hours to, to days, uh, Hagar gives up and simply accepts her fate. And she can't bear to watch her son die, so she places him under a bush and then goes a ways off. It says about a bow shot away, so probably 100 yards or so. Um, and uh, basically just to wait for death to come for her and her son. But she, does, she doesn't have an encounter with death. She has an encounter with the God of life. And this is where I want to bring the Genesis 16 back, story back into our story here because of the, the similarities. In fact, uh, there's some who believe that maybe these are just two different accounts of the same story, basically the same story told twice. So back in 16, uh, shortly after Hagar became pregnant with Ishmael, Sarah began treating her very harshly, as, as I pointed out. And uh, this is to the point where Hagar can no longer stand it, and she just runs away uh, to a very similar place where she is now in chapter 21. And here God sees her distress and speaks to her and reassures her that God will take care of her and her son. God notices the, the cast off, the, the marginalized. Hagar is overwhelmed and gives God the name El Roy, which means the God who sees. And just a, an interesting fact that uh, she, Hagar, uh, is the, the first person in the Bible to give God a name. Uh, not one of the great patriarchs or one of the prophets, but an Egyptian slave girl who's been mistreated and abused. So the narrative in 16 ends with Hagar returning to Sarah. And then back in chapter 21, God once again, again hears the cries of Ishmael and Hagar and opens her eyes to see a nearby spring. She and Ishmael drink from the spring, and then we get a sort of epilogue that says God was with Ishmael, and that Ishmael became an expert in, uh, with the bow, uh, kind of a reference back to the, the bow shot away. Um, and then Ishmael is gone from the narrative until the death of Abraham, but God fulfilled God's promise to Abraham through Ishmael, that he too would be made into a great nation. But I want to go back and consider that name uh, given to God, uh, by Hagar, the God who sees. A few minutes ago, we were talking about the extras in our lives, the, the discarded and the marginalized. I think maybe if, if Hagar uh, were a, a Catholic saint, she might be the, the patron saint of the outcast. 
She's an Egyptian slave girl in a foreign land. She becomes Abraham's concubine, which creates tension between her and Sarah. And then the outcast is literally cast out into the wilderness, and yet God sees her and hears her cries. In a way, this foreshadows the, the plights of the Israelites in Egypt. Uh, after 400 years of slavery, God hears the cries of God's people and remembers God's promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God looks out for the outcast and marginalized. God notices not those in power, but those who are oppressed and abused by those in power. I'm reminded of uh, a song from Disney's uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame, uh, kind of one of the, the deep cut uh, animated films. Um, but Esmeralda, who's uh, this gypsy woman at the center of the story, sings a song called God Help the Outcast. I'm not going to sing it. Um, <laughs> maybe, Rick, if you want to... just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, the, the, the first verse goes, uh, I don't know if you can hear me or if you're even there. I don't know if you'll listen to a gypsy's prayer. Yes, I know I'm just an outcast. I shouldn't speak to you. Still, I see your face and wonder, were you an outcast too? So let me ask, have you ever felt unseen or unnoticed? Have you ever felt like uh, an extra in someone else's story? I'm reminded of a line from uh, T.S. Eliot's poem, uh, The Love Song of J.L. for Proofrock, um, which if you haven't read, uh, I, I encourage you to do so. Um, but it's basically this epic pity party of a middle-aged man who desperately wants to be part of the social scene in, in London, but is too insecure and too afraid of what others might think to actually put himself out there uh, and, and engage in uh, the, the, the social setting and such. And there's a line that goes, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be, am an attendant lord, at times indeed almost ridiculous, at, almost at times the fool. The speaker in this poem is saying that he's not even the protagonist in his own story, or doesn't see himself as the protagonist in his own story, but rather just as a bit player uh, in someone else's story. And he's not even the court gesture, just someone milling around in, in the background. And I imagine we all have, at times, felt overlooked. Maybe you had a great idea, uh, but were brushed aside when you brought that idea up to your boss. Or maybe you were the proverbial middle, middle child, always overshadowed by your younger or, old, younger or older siblings. Or maybe you're always picked last for soccer or kickball at recess in elementary school. If you were ever any of these things, you're in good company. Um, I won't go into all the stories, but I've experienced uh, each of those at, at some point. Um, but whatever your situation, know, know this, that God sees you, God notices you, God hears your lonely cries, our God is the God who sees one of my favorite poets, uh, who I've uh, quoted from uh, before in previous sermons, uh, Kyle Tran Meyer, uh, has a poem called Cart Pushers that captures this idea of taking notice of the unnoticed. So the, the poem is a senior cart pusher that the people go out and you know, wrangle up the, the shopping carts in, in the parking lots, uh, giving advice to the, the newbie on how to make it through the, the daily grind of such a hard job. And towards the end of the poem, he says, just be careful, because these people, uh, they'll look right through you when, you when they back out of their spots, when they take that corner at 30 miles an hour, when they forget that they forgot to use a blinker and cuss you out for walking through the crosswalk. See, to that guy, we're just background noise. Uncredited extras in the 80-year-long made-for-TV romantic comedy that he calls life. We are neurons flickering stupidly, infantry stomping through the dreams he won't remember upon waking. And remember, when they look right through you, you're still there. You are still there. And the God who sees is the God who notices you. But it doesn't end there. Just as God sees us when we are cast aside, we need to look for those uh, around us who have also been cast aside. We see throughout scripture that God holds a special place for the outcasts and marginalized. Think about it. Uh, Moses stuttered and lacked self-confidence. David was the youngest of a shepherding family, or sheepherding family. The mother of Christ was a teenage peasant from a lowly village. And Jesus' disciples were basically leftovers, those who were not chosen by other rabbis. God goes out of God's way to choose the lowly outcasts to do God's work and receive special honor, and we ought to do the same. There's an interesting line in verse 18 of our scripture where 
God tells Hagar to lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand. When God sees Hagar and Ishmael, God doesn't merely see two individuals in need of water. God sees two people who need each other. Ishmael needs the support of his mother, and Hagar needs to be there to offer that hand of support. Likewise, we need to see that we have a part to play in the lives of those who are cast out and discarded. I think God would say to us, lift up this precious person and hold them fast with your hand. So what might that look like? Well, Jesus tells us in Matthew 25 that whatever we do or don't do for the, quote, least of these, uh, we do for Jesus himself. Have you ever thought about how that might work? I don't think it's simply that Jesus has a special affinity for those cast aside by society, but when we serve the poor and the sick and the needy and the imprisoned, we do so by recognizing the humanity and the image of God in those individuals. They're not simply extras in our story. They're fellow human beings made in the image of God. I read somewhere that whenever lines or boundaries are drawn uh, that are meant to divide us from them, that Jesus usually stands on the side of them. Jesus stands with the outcast, the marginalized, and the discarded. And we as Jesus followers ought to do the same. Amen. Let's pray. Eternal loving God, we come here this morning to deepen our relationship with you and with all of your children. We lift those in our hearts who have never known the path that leads to a deeper relationship as we heard in this message this morning. So this morning we lift up those that are on that journey. And we lift up those who are the covenant players for uh, our annual conference, along with those who are worshiping this morning at Alhambra United Methodist Church and Holston United Methodist Church in Pasadena. While our hearts are heavy with the passing of Joanne, and our prayers go out to Jeff, Allie, and the entire family. We give thanks for her life, that it was well lived, and the outpouring of affection with which we celebrated her life yesterday. We pray for Ellen and her family with the passing of Ariel. May all who mourn be comforted by the love of Christ and fond memories. Prayers of healing and comfort for Jan, Pam's cousin, battling a return of cancer now in her bones. Be with Fred, healing from multiple health problems and mourning the loss of his wife. Lord, we ask your blessings on Martha as she's recovering from a broken hip. We pray for Ross, healing from heart surgery this week. And we pray for a little baby, Leland, undergoing uh, a recovery, hopefully to be whole and happy soon. We pray for the surgeons for their skill and the parents for strength and faith. We continue to pray, Lord, for Reuben, recently diagnosed with ALS, and for his wife, Karen, for strength for her journey. We ask it be with Pat for healing of those continuing problems following her uh, broken leg. We pray for Chad and for all others who are battling uh, uh, with alcohol and substance abuse to find the path that leads to sobriety and hope. Be with Ralph and all those suffering from dementia, that they may have compassionate care and remember better days. 
Lord, Sharon is still in critical care with many health concerns. And so we ask for healing care for her and for Ken, her husband, strength and sustaining faith. We give you thanks and praise for those who have won their battle with cancer. And we ask for that same result for all those who are fighting that battle. We lift up Kathy, for John, Carrie, Judy's sister Joanne, Terry, Tracy, Georgia, Karen, Jennifer, a little boy, Logan, Bill, Heather, Debbie, Joshua, Leslie, Ruby, Ariel, Tony, Sylvia, Rosanna, Frank, Angel, Joey, and Bob and Beth's daughter-in-law, Melissa. There are many who this week are traveling, including our pastor. May their travels be safe and recharging and that they return to us safely soon. We give you thanks for the life, for the death, the resurrection of your son Jesus, the Christ. And we pray together now the prayer that he gave to his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we consider all that God has delivered to us and is delivering right this moment, let us consider how we can give back a small portion thereof.
Loving, eternal God, we give you thanks for all that we have received and are receiving. We give you thanks for this wonderful time together this morning. And we thank you most of all for the love of your son, Jesus. And we just ask that you accept these, our gifts and tithes, just a small token of what we have received, that they might be used to help others to see their part in your plan. In Jesus' name, amen. And our closing hymn is O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Uh, and actually the fourth verse kind of popped out to me just now. Uh, he breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can take the foulest, can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. And actually an interesting statistic is that in the Bible, the exact same amount of times that blood is mentioned is the exact same amount of times that sin is mentioned. So there's enough blood to cover all sin. So. <laughs> benediction hear these words of Jesus are not five sparrows sold for a penny and yet not one of them is forgotten by God so fear not you're you are of more value than many sparrows as we leave this place may you go and know uh, your value as one who's made in the image of God and may you see the image of God in all whom you meet I guess I can do this. Uh, you can have a seat. So, a uh, variety of things happening in our church. We've got uh, the summer uh, study series with Pastor Jim at uh, Tuesdays at 10. Uh, they're not meeting on the 4th or the 11th, um, but that's uh, here at church. What else do we have? We have uh, Carol's study that uh, I think is coming Close to an end, but uh, I'm sure another one will pick up soon. But uh, you're welcome to join in that study. Uh, and we've got uh, men's breakfast uh, this coming Saturday, July 1st at Denny's, 8 o'clock. Women's fellowship uh, breakfast July 8th at Pickles at 9. And then a variety of summer activities uh, through uh, Pastor Christie and Caneo Connects. And we've got our Family Vacation Bible School. This is open to people of all ages, uh, August 6th through 10th. And then uh, our altar flowers are provided by Debbie, and uh, our fellowship host is Robin, so thank you for that. And really quickly, before we get to birthdays, I, I was asked to remind you all that Script is back. Uh, again, these are uh, gift cards to a variety of stores, restaurants, uh, things like that that you can purchase from us. Uh, you get the, the face value of the, the gift card to spend at those places. 
but the, the church gets a, a percentage of the, the money. So cash or, or check, uh, you can see Stephanie or Kathy about that. And then our birthdays, we've got Katie and Miley and Jennifer St. Amand uh, on the 25th, that's today. We've got uh, Simon Shapiro, we've got Aaron Ferguson, uh, Heather MacArthur, Steve Wheatley, and more. Uh, Danny St. Ledger, Rod Wilmer, Caleb Geralds, and first week in July, uh, Debbie Dyer and little Benny Ferguson. So let's sing happy birthday. <laughs> So another uh, quick announcement, this will be for the week after this week, that the office will be closed July 3rd and 4th uh, for the holiday weekend, long holiday weekend, and have a blessed day. Welcome home. <laughs>